fairly simple. Again, Turd, I didn't say it was easy, but it's sure a lot easier to understand cotton. We know what it is. We use it every day, most people. And what you have to do is figure out whether there's too much cotton or too little cotton. I didn't say that was easy. You know, there are millions of people every day trying to figure it out and get rich. But if you can do your homework, and I wouldn't invest in anything or suggest investing in anything unless one understands it and has done a lot of homework themselves. I wouldn't listen to anybody you hear on the radio, the internet, TV, including me, anybody you read in the newspapers. The only way you're going to be successful at anything is to do your own research, your own homework. And then when you think you understand what you're doing and you think you've got some money lying in the corner, but all you have to do is go over and pick it up, that's when you act. Don't jump around. One mistake that many people in markets make is they think they have to be doing something all the time. No, that's a terrible mistake. The best thing you can do as an investor is do nothing most of the time. I mean, unless you're a day trader or something like that, a short-term trader. Most fortunes are made by guys who wait until they find something that they know is a sure thing or nearly a sure thing, and then they jump in with both feet. I would urge people to do the same thing with commodities and not invest. The mistakes people make in the commodities are nearly always the same mistakes they made in anything. Uh, but I do urge people to understand that if you do your homework, commodities are easier to understand than stocks. Just kind of a follow-up question to that, Jim. Do you, uh, a lot of folks are getting started with the kind of a hybrid product of commodity ETFs or even exchange traded notes too. Do you, uh, do you like that idea? Do you find that's a good way for people to, uh, to put a toe in the water? Well, it would depend on who's, who's backing it and who's administering it. But yes, if you do your research and you're sure that it's sound, by all means, it's, uh, you make a lot more money in futures, Turd, as you know, because of the leverage. I mean, you only have to put down 5 or 10% and you can buy huge amounts of most commodities. You cannot do that with stocks or ETFs. Having said that, uh, if you understand specific commodities, ETFs are a way. I presume you're talking about ETFs on specific commodities, uh, then yes. But I will quickly add to her that the studies show that most people are better off investing in indexes, no matter what the asset class. As you well know, passive investing outperforms active managers 70 or 75 percent of the time year after year after year. So most people, if they decide to invest in commodities, having done their homework, investing in an index is the best way to invest. But that's true of stocks, bonds, currencies, and everything else. Jim, that's fabulous. Thank you. Uh, Jim, this is plain. Some argue that one of China's advantages over most Western economies is that its central bank is state-owned and aligned to lead to productive economic growth, while Western central banks are designed for the interests of financiers. Do you think that Western central banks may fail, and do you see much hope of the West moving more towards the Chinese model of industrial development as opposed to financial and speculative development? Plain in the U.S., we've had three central banks in our history. The first two disappeared for a variety of reasons. In my view, this one's going to disappear too. Between Greenspan and Bernanke, they keep making so many unbelievable mistakes that they're going to destroy the central bank, which in my view, in this particular case, will be good because they're really making the world worse instead of better. Now, the world without central banks or without a country without a central bank has problems, but in the world we're living in now, most central banks are making things worse, certainly in the U.S. The U.S. central bank had a balance sheet with about $800 billion dollars of government bonds three years ago. Now they've got, they've tripled it and it's mainly garbage and junk. And plus they're printing huge amounts of money, which are making, which is making the world more unstable 
and leading to more inflation and artificially low interest rates. And artificially low interest rates, once they go back to their normal, will overshoot on the upside and we will have, have higher interest rates than we would have expected otherwise. So yes, I expect this central bank in the US to disappear. The one in the UK probably will, at least in its per present incarnation. Will they go to the Chinese model? Well, probably, just given that politicians like to have as much control as they po possibly can. So it's not good that politicians necessarily have control, but that's undoubtedly what will happen in the next reincarnation. Okay, but then I guess the question is, would that move the West more towards industrial development? I mean, some say that one of the great advantages of China is that their leaders tend to be engineers as opposed to, say, American Britain with all these lawyers. Any well, thoughts on that? The Chinese are, in my view, one of the reasons they're so successful is they have this very, very high rate of savings and investing. I think most economists, including Karl Marx, realize that you have to develop capital in order to develop an economy. Without capital and savings and investing, it's very difficult to develop your economy. In the U.S. and the West, or certainly the U.S. anyway, we have, have had recently a negative savings rate. You know, we're using up our capital at a rapid rate. Government spending is certainly not building new capital, uh, investment capital, or any kind of capital in the U.S. So it's going to take a lot more than just changing the central bank. No country in history uh, had plane has gotten itself into that's gotten itself into this kind of debtor situation has gotten itself out without a crisis or a semi crisis. So we will undoubtedly have our crisis or our semi crises, and eventually, after lots of bankruptcies and pain and agony, then we will start over. A debt will be wiped out, and we will then save and invest. Everybody will be panicked and scared as they were after the 1930s. And then conceivably the U.S. can have a, a more prosperous future. But this debt, we're the largest debtor nation in the history of the world, Plain. Not the largest debtor nation in the world, the largest, the largest in the history of the world. So this is not going to be solved just by changing the central bank or even the central bankers. Well, then I guess a related question would be that crisis or a series of crises that you see, uh, might they resemble the end of the uh, USSR? In other words, uh, you know, a crash where you have to slough off the fringes and, uh, you know, cut your military 80% and, uh, and go through a lot of suffering. Well, undoubtedly, yes. I don't know if it'll be like the collapse of the USSR. I don't think that Alaska is going to suddenly be an independent state, or Hawaii, or even Florida, although certainly people in the U.S. who would like to secede uh, from, from the well, U.S. Well, I was arguing more that we have, you know, American Samoa, and, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of bases around the world. We, we don't call them part of the country exactly, but we have a fairly, you know, one could argue an imperialistic policy at times. Well, we have troops stationed in over 120 countries around the world, including places like you mentioned. Um, the kind of crisis that I'm talking about is certainly going to lead to a serious, major, major cutback in our military commitments abroad. We can't afford it anymore. That's one reason we're going broke. The British, you know, in 1918, if you looked at a map of the world plane, it was all red because the British Empire was everywhere. But within one generation, the UK, was in a sh uh, economic shambles, and within three generations, they were bankrupt. They couldn't sell government bonds. The IMF had to bail them out it, within three generations, and they cut back enormously. They didn't have troops. I mean, they had a few troops here and there, but no, massive, massive military installations that the Brits had, even in 1918, disappeared. Now you have very few British troops anywhere, even in the UK. So, no, that will certainly happen to, to the U.S. 
Well, that's certainly uh, something that we're all wondering about. It, it just looks like we go from one expansion to another. You know, it seems almost endless. Now there's talk of going into Syria. So where will it end is the question. It will end. It will end as I said. In a financial crisis or semi-crisis when we realize we cannot afford it anymore. Or, or maybe we'll, you know, some some country will r- run us off. The Vietnamese did it. I mean, it could certainly happen that we could get, quote, defeated in some of these adventures that we're starting, partly because we don't have the money. You know, I was with the head of the Air Force a year or two ago, and he told me that he, the average plane in the U.S. military is 28 years old. He told me he had grandfathers who'd flown a plane, fathers who'd flown the plane, and now the grandson was flying the plane. Because they're so old. Our military personnel is worn out. Some of these guys have been abroad three or four times in wars in the recent years. You know, the, the hardware, the software, the people, everything is overextended. So we're, we're shooting ourselves in the foot in more ways than one. I think our feet already hurt. Oh, yeah, it certainly looks like... And her feet hurt from what they're doing. It is ludicrous. Yeah, it certainly just looks like we're going from bad to worse. Well, thank you for that. Now I'll turn you over to uh, Green Meadow. Hi, Jim. This is Green Meadow. I have a question about GMO seeds and corporate agriculture companies. Monsanto has been a profitable company, but there's been more and more backlash and concern about the consequences of GMO seeds on health. There have also been some problems with the economics and politics of corporate agriculture. For example, in the Iraq peace agreement, farmers must buy seeds from the U.S. You've also commented on a lack of farmers, but small farmers cannot compete economically or politically with corporate petrochemical farms. 